Hi, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money, the base, on your mind, or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. They like to lie about things in order to cheat and steal and, and everything. This Babylonian system, uh, it's all involved with money. And Jesus was quite well aware of the problems with money. He told his disciples to go forth without any money in their purses. But here's one of these words that besides the word mammon that is not translated correctly. Uh, Jesus said you can't serve God or mammon, but uh, they don't. it really means money, you see. But the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed. But the karagma, it really means money. You can see in the unabridged Greek-English lexicon that it means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. And like, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the number of the beast, you'll, uh, I did some editing there to finally explain that the mark of the beast is really money. And then I also did some editing on the word uh, mammon in uh, the Wikipedia. I finally got my Wikipedia editing rights back after several years of uh, ranting and raving about things that they don't like, you know, they, they're very, they don't like anybody putting conspiracy theories on there, I guess, you know, these high school kids, and they probably got a lot of CIA people that monitor the, the uh, Wikipedia, because it, uh, a lot of people go there for research, I kind of like to go there for research to see, what, you know, what's, like, for scientific things, like what bursitis is, or, um, they have an interesting article on Libya, like during Gaddafi's uh, reign. And Gaddafi uh, was one of those people who believed in eliminating money. It's really a terrible shame what happened to him. But anyway, I've got a lawsuit against me. This really rotten person here in town that owns this company, NT Properties, is trying to steal some vacant lots from me. And uh, he's got a really old judge, who's, or not judge, but um, attorney who's uh, been in Tucson for like 40 years working for a really good law firm. This guy Feldman was one of the uh, appellate court judges. But uh, you can see here in the Sycamore Vista subdivision, they're uh, coming after me on these lots saying that I owe $440,000 because of these bogus liens that they put on my lots. It's a big story and I've written a blog about it. I've had these lots out there on the southeast side near Suarita and Houghton in this subdivision that they started building on but never finished and so now there's all these liens for construction work that I never really authorized. They sucked us into this HOA so we were there was a new case out uh, in regards to basically what the kind of problem we're having out there and if I'd have known this sooner I would have gone to court and had this settled but I sent this postcard out to all the other minority lot owners the person who's suing me owns about 1,300 lots and us minority lot owners we have maybe oh maybe 200 lots between us I've got 50 lots there but Visit my website here. I've done a really good job trying to tell the story. And uh, I'll do, next show I'll talk more about it. I'll let you look at that a little bit longer. But uh, I'll um, get all the papers together and explain exactly what's happening. Right now, my attorney is preparing an answer for this. And we're going to basically say that they had no right to turn these deed restrictions into CC&Rs and start charging us all these dues to put in infrastructure. I mean, if you know they want to put the infrastructure in for their lots, that's okay. But, um, you know, they shouldn't make us pay for it. I mean, we got ripped off. They were charging us too much money and, and taking too long to finish the job. But um, the point is, these liens have expired. It's been more than six years since these liens were due, so uh, I don't know really what their argument's going to be. But the people that, the prior ma majority lot owners, are being sued by a guy named 
Derry Dean Sparlin for like, uh, they stole like a million dollars from him. They, extor they didn't extort it, but they, they just like didn't disclose all the details of some of these things he was investing in. It's like um, the uh, securities fraud is what they call it. And he's got a really good lawyer. I've got uh, the whole case of his. It reads like a, a novel. Uh, and and uh, I really hope he wins. But the same guys that he's suing were involved in this Sycamore Vista subdivision. And um, I think one of them was convicted for some kind of securities fraud before, the, the worst one of them. But, uh, well, here we got this picture. It was in the New York Times the other day. They're having some kind of festival in Hindi, in India. I was about to say India because they're Hindus. But uh, you can see they have these pontoon bridges going across this river. And like every 12 years or so, they're supposed to take a bath in there. And it's, you know, but they had 30 people killed in a stampede at a railroad station. Here's a picture of some guy grieving with his child. But uh, let's see what I have underlined here. Oh, yeah, here. They've got a, a procession of naked mystics. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. People crowd around them. And then the mystics had to fight their way back to shore. Behind the mystics were saffron-robed gurus on silver thrones. I mean, you know, they talk in the Bible about people pretending to be pious and all that stuff. The Pharisees. Government officials estimated that 10 million pilgrims were encamped in Alabar on Saturday night with 20 to 30 million expected to bathe by Monday. So about 80 million pilgrims, roughly the population of Germany, are expected at some point in Kumba's 55-day run. Uh, I mean, like back in uh, the Greek times, they had these Elysian festivals, and, uh, and uh, they're talking about lost children, people, old people and stuff. But like, they had these Elysian festivals like in Greece, and they'd, um, you know, Greece is a very beautiful country, so they all went to some beautiful place there. I don't know how many years this went on for, maybe 500, I don't know. But, uh, you know, then Christianity came along and kind of wrecked everything. And, well, it wasn't really Christianity, it was St. Paul that came along. And and he's, it's really Paulianity. He's the one that, uh, you know, like I was saying, Jesus was aware of this money. He told his disciples to go forth without money in their purses. And he said, you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. But the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed. And that's in the book of Luke there. But uh, yeah, most of these religions that are in the world today are like irrational. But, uh, you know, I mean, like these festivals are pretty cool. I mean, I like to go to this Burning Man festival. It's in a very, I like the environment, you know, it's a salt flat up in Nevada and they had a pretty good snow up there this winter and so the snow will pack down this salt flat <clears throat> so that it's going to be really flat and then it'll have like these nice crack patterns in the in the playa, you know, it's just like you take a hit of acid or something and the playa is like moving, you know, and all these lines and it's so, uh, you know, when the, when the playa is really hard, it's it's great to be out there, but a couple of years ago, I don't, like 2010, I think it was dry, you know, we were having a drought and what do we got playing here? Oh. <laughs> I got this um, iPod just running on uh, um, at random. This is called H.G. Wells' Takeoff by Amon Duel the, in The Dance of the Lemmings. I think it's probably like from the 70s. It's not a bad one, but it's not the best. But like I was ta telling you about, you know, these festivals and like they say at the Elysian Festival they had some kind of substance they drank and they became euphoric, I guess, or something. They called it kuchen. 
and I don't know, some kind of liqueur, or some people say that it was like uh, maybe mushrooms or something, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe in, like, psychedelic drugs and, and mushrooms, you know, psychedelic mushrooms. And, um, you know, if it was part of our culture, like it was in Mexico and for so many years, and, and the Native Americans had their peyote, it's like an initiation, you know, like before you get into high school, because, you know, if you're going to get a little bit older, you might end up taking it yourself and having a, a bad trip or something. And, and so, like, they want to initiate you slowly. And, um, you know, it's like, you know, the movie The Matrix where they have the red pill and the blue pill, and it's pretty true. You know, these people, they, um, they're stupefied. It's like Karl Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses. And so opiates are, uh, they... Um, they stupefy you, and uh, and that's what alcohol does. And I think the most uh, um, biggest prescribed drug now are these opiates, and um, there's so much misuse of them. In fact, I've got a chart here that shows like the the um, number of people being arrested for drugs. And it, you know, I, I should probably maybe next time come back. You know, like what kind of drugs are they? A lot of these drugs, you know, I'm not. You know, I, I think there's some nasty drugs like, like cocaine and crack and uh, this stuff they call glass. But you can see, like, that's 1980. And uh, so at, at 80, 90, that's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. 30 years here almost, yeah. It's uh, really gone up. What is this? Estimate, these are just drug offenders. 500,000 drug offenders. It's like, you know, I mean, why do people do this, these bad drugs? You know, I've seen so much um, horror stories. I mean, I've done it before, and I, I mean, I don't want anybody wants to feel like that. <laughs> you know, the, this is kind of interesting. The, there's uh, 1 in 87 white people are in, uh, incarcerated, 1 in 12 blacks. And then one in 36 Hispanic people between uh, the rates of incarceration. And then, then here, for people that are aged 20 to 34 who dropped out of high school, boy, that's pretty bad. The Hispanics are, I guess, you know, the ones that drop out of high school are working. But... Um, one in three blacks who drop out of high school ends up in jail or something. It's not good. And one in eight whites, but... Uh, so there is some kind of truth to, um, you know, like... I mean, I, I'd rather... You know, if I saw three black men in the alley, <laughs> you know, and three white guys, you know, I'd, I'd feel a little bit safer with the white men, you know, I mean... I'm not, you know, I mean, that's just rational um, thinking there. You know, it's like, uh, you know, there's statistics of it. So, let's see what we got here. Here's another interesting chart about um, airplane travel and how it, it causes so much carbon. I never realized this. The carbon footprint from, uh, from, from, this is per passenger, three round trips between Chicago and Frankfurt produce 10 tons of carbon dioxide per passenger. That's an incredible amount. Here's, let's see, a year's worth of electricity for a household. <clears throat> so that's how much your house makes. Flying coast to coast, six. A year's driving is three. And then uh, commuting. 100 miles a week, you know. Well, that's a year's commuting you know, in a car, 100 miles a week. But this, that's the thing there. It's like flying overseas. So, I mean, imagine how much pollution that Hillary Clinton caused through all her travels, you know. I mean, what did she even accomplish? It, nothing, really. They had an article in the New York Times today about how they're going to get all the... Uh, all the equipment out of 
They've got like $28 billion worth of equipment over in Afghanistan. You know, big, huge trucks and things like that. And there's no port, you know. Afghanistan is a landlocked state, so they have to, uh, and Pakistan doesn't like us going through there. They closed the borders after we used one of the drones on there and <laughs> people there. And so, you know, they're not very reliable. So we've got to get all that equipment out of there. But... Uh, so there's this article, Al Gore wrote a book, you know, recently. I like Al Gore, you know, I mean, even though he's like a rich plutocrat and, you know, he made a lot of money selling his TV station to Al Jazeera, but look at this picture, I mean, wow, that's that's a pretty heavy picture. Let's see who, t that's like, I mean, where did they get that? Is, did he release that or is that like on the back of the book or something? I don't see any picture credits here anywhere. But his new book, it's called um, The Future, Six Drivers of Global Change. And uh, let's see here. He, uh, I'll just, uh, let's see here. I'll just read it here and I'll read it here to you. I can't, he complains that virtually every news and political commentary program on television is sponsored in part by oil, coal, and gas companies. That's pretty true. Like, if you watch these Sunday TV shows, they have, um, you know, um, those, um, you know, we've, you know, even Obama was talking about it at his uh, State of the Union. You know, he said, "Oh, we've got so much oil," and you know, uh, and people were clapping. And but you know, it's kind of like my sister's an expert on this, and and um, and I don't know how what Al Gore handles this. It says, but. But you know this fracking and this tearing up the tar sands up there, and and all this stuff, and plus you know the global warming that it's causing, it's just um, heading for a disaster. He, what does he say here? Messages tried to soothe the audience that everything is fine, the global environment is not threatened, and carbon companies are working diligently to further develop renewable energy resources. I mean that uh, that's not really true. They're not. They're you know, there's such a massive change we'd have to do to in order to really survive. It's called peak oil, and and I, and I really believe that disaster is going to come. Like if peak oil doesn't get us, then uh, then the funny money or the global warming will. And there was a, an article. Um, you know, they're saying that it's much worse than, you know, they, they realize. They keep coming up with new studies showing that it's that there's going to be even more water, you know. I mean, New York is just the start, well, and Katrina, too. So, let's see, 90 million extra tons of heat trap and global warming pollution is produced every 24 hours. 90 million extra tons. Wow. That's a lot of pollution and um, two billion dollar facility to have the capacity to monitor every telephone call yeah he, this is what he says they're going to build a two billion dollar facility in utah by the national security agency that will have the capacity to monitor every telephone call email message text message google search or other electronic communication whether encrypted or not sent to or from any American citizen, Mr. Gore says. I mean, you know, I might, I might you know, I mean, this this book, uh, it's a good review, you know, and there's been a, it's like a genre now that a lot of people are writing. You know, it wasn't too popular for quite a while. My mom got me kind of started on it with The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. I, think, I don't know if it was 19, it was in the 60s when he wrote that, and then they had the Club of Rome book called um, you know, Limits to Growth in, in, in like the 70s. And they used computer models to show that we're running out of minerals and we're even running out of uranium and, and other things, and oil too. So, you know, there's been warnings, but it seems like from, you know, and the hippies were aware of it. You know, a lot of them went back to nature and lived in... Um, the forests and stuff like that and, and started organic gardening like Steve Gaskin's farm down in Somerton, Tennessee is uh, one of the relics of the hippies and 
they deliver babies down there and uh, have farms. They produce a lot of their own uh, food, like they make tofu burgers and stuff like that. But uh, so there's been, you know, like not too many people for a long time. You know, they weren't really talking about the environment. It was all just, you know, like kind of like the Roaring Twenties and everybody was just um, you know having a blast but then you know the, the music stopped playing when these plutocrats ripped us off with this uh, funny money scam and, and that's the other thing that could get us like if the oil price goes up it's gonna throw a monkey wrench in the in the development and um, so that's why they're so desperate to just get oil anywhere they can and uh, I guess you know a lot of people I mean why else would they have on these talk shows that, oh, you know, it's, it's wonderful, we're going to have plenty of oil. I think that a lot of investors and a lot of middle-class people are starting to realize that, you know, this can't go on like this. You know, it's, it's just not feasible. It's not sustainable. So, I mean, we've got a lot of these people that are what they call preppers. In fact, they've got a National Geographic show about preppers and uh, things... There, that woman whose son killed those people in Sandy Hook there, were, um, her, she was a prepper. It's like, I am too, my older sister is, but, you know, I mean, I don't have a, a, a bug-out bag or, or I don't have my car equipped to carry extra gasoline or anything, but, you know, I'm, I watch the signs of the times, and, you know, and I can tell when things are going to get bad, basically, because... Um, you know, it doesn't. Ha it it could happen overnight if we had like a, um, you know, like one of those asteroids that crashed in the Soviet Union today. I and mean, you know, if that crashed in into the Capitol building when President Obama was speaking, or if it crashed into New York City in Manhattan, or or um, or Japan somewhere, it would really cause, you know, a lot of damage. But this was somewhere out in the middle of. Uh, the Soviet Union that this thing crashed and it could happen just any time you know just could happen right here when I'm sitting here and nobody even saw this one coming there was like another one that passed by today but uh, you know and they were all watching that one but uh, this one came down and uh, hit them well and then we had that poor guy that got uh, killed in that cabin you know it was another Waco style uh, murder there and and the, even the cops were saying let's burn him out of there let's just you know get rid of him that way and um, from what I've heard you know the guy wrote a manifesto I'm just surprised this doesn't happen more you know with these so with these corrupt courts you know and uh, and well it happens a lot in the post office and it, it does happen in the military you know like if you're on the field and you've got a commander you don't like what do they call that when you shoot your commander? It's f fracking, maybe? I, th I can't remember what they call it when you... Sh what? Somebody just, somebody's out there acting crazy. But they have um, these um, things you can... Hey, there's somebody in here. It's called fragging. Oh, fragging. Like that's what it is. Okay, yeah, you frag your... Um, that's the uh, studio guy. He was saying that it's called fragging when you... So thanks for getting me. I forgot what I was talking about. But that guy, that Negro that got killed in that cabin was just like Waco. And he had a manifesto that uh, it was explaining that he was working as, um, you know, a policeman. Uh, he was just starting out, a rookie, and he observed the, some one of his fellow officers beating somebody up. You know, he was like a whistleblower. And he says, you know, you shouldn't be beating this guy up. So, you know, this cop, he, he didn't, know what else to do, you know, and he kind of freaked out and took revenge on these people. And, you know, I used to some feel that way when I was younger. But, you know, like I'm, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more. But, um, you know, the guy just um, got a, a rotten deal and, and got screwed. And like I'm kind of get, I hope I don't get screwed with these vacant lots that I was telling you about now. Now go check out my, uh, my web page there for, for this vacant lot thing that I'm having problems with. I've got a lawyer to help me. Anyway, my name is Raquel. Or you can go to my website too. There it is. Alright, bye.